Namaste, Jean. Welcome to Ahimsa Conversations. Um, as with everyone else, I will ask firstly, what is your earliest memory of Ahimsa, of either the experience of it or the idea, the ideal, the principle? Well, um, it's when I saw some people uh, in Latin America who uh, were working on the land. Then there was a law that was passed in Ecuador and they were, the landless people were given an entitlement to the land. The landlords didn't concede it. And with the help of the local police, they just maintained uh, their possessions without sharing a tiny bit of it. But the people went to occupy the land that they were entitled to. And then they were put in jail, which was not totally legal, but you know, with the help of the police, that's what happened. Then the women went to occupy the land and they had to release the men. But the men went back to occupy the land. So they were put back in jail and the women went to occupy the land. And in the end, they were also put, by, put in jail, but the children went to occupy the land. And in the end, they put the men, the women, and the children were you know, also sequestrated somehow. Then there was a radio of the, the bishop, the local bishop, Catholic bishop. And he warned people in other areas of the country. And the people started marching to that place and occupy the land. And you see, in just a few months, these people who had nothing then obtained what they were entitled to because with not one action, just doing what, they, what was fair to do, uh, everybody understood the violence that they were experiencing and that changed. And, you know, with that under my eyes, uh, it was striking that uh, you, can, you can move. There was another example that I lived directly in the United States. It is in the 70s. Just after 1968, the time when, you know, there's some kind of revolution, uh, change of life and and in one area of Philadelphia, there was a, a group that referred to Gandhi even. Uh, it was called the Movement for a New Society. And people were clustering in living communities, practicing some kind of uh, service to the community uh, also in addition to do the, doing their normal work. And there was one problem that popped up that they saw, and it was the uh, increasing lack of security of people being uh, mobbed in the streets, uh, robbed of their, uh, of a little bit of money. And very often it was because people needed to buy drugs, you know, drug addicts and, 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 and that. But you know, that problem of insecurity in the streets was strong. And what is the reaction when somebody is attacked in the street to get her or his money? Usually people protect themselves and they run away. Now there was uh, always somebody who called the police. We didn't have uh, mobile phones at that time. It wasn't yet created. And uh, police comes and helps the victim. But at that stage, the person is a victim has been robbed. And so they decided to speak to the people and to see what could be done. They had ideas about what could be done, but they didn't go to share their ideas. They went as a midwife, you know, trying to help the community come up with a solution. They spoke to people door to door, organized meetings, in buildings, in the neighborhoods, in the, uh, all sorts of associations. It went on for a year and a half. It took a year and a half. 
But the people found their solution and they understood that if you are together, if we all take the risk, then we share it and we are strong together. And, and so they organized and if anyone was attacked, the reaction was exactly the opposite. They, would, they even gave uh, people who are vulnerable with a, a sound horn, you know, that you press, it's like a spray, but when you press, it makes a sound. Yeah. And you can go around and you have it around your neck. If you're attacked, you make some noise. Immediately, everybody shows up. People go out in the street. Uh, if they're on the 15th floor, they open the door and they shout and they make noise. If you're in a car, you stop your car, block the traffic, go out and, 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 and be present to each other. It became the safest neighbor, neighborhood in the entire United States. Now that showed me the power of nonviolence that can be done either by indigenous people, you know, who have nothing in one place and can start living a good life and uh, ordinary people of all kinds uh, can uh, also show solidarity. I mean, these things were examples that struck me and, and that showed me how powerful nonviolence can be. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. What made you a war resistor? Because I know that you went to jail uh, in France for refusing to be drafted. So can you tell me firstly, what is your own personal motive for that? And then how that led to your engagement with the anti-war movement? Well, you know, I was, uh, I was born in a very modest family. I was born of deaf parents. So I know what it is to uh, suffer some disability and, 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 uh, and the difficulties of life. But my parents were very generous. And, and um, even when they had nothing left, they shared what they had with the others. So they taught me uh, the importance of uh, being present for the others. Now, um, I studied physics initially, then I studied other things later on, but, uh, and, and I started my uh, professional life working as an engineer in a big multinational company. And at the same time, I was assistant to a professor at the university and preparing my PhD. And whether in the private sector or at the university, they were presenting the uh, research work that I was doing to the military in order to get funding because uh, the military has the wisdom to fund a hundred projects in order to find the two or three that they can use. And, you know, I, I thought about that and I, I said, I haven't come to this world to help kill better, more precisely, more massively. You know, I, what I, I felt, you know, my uh, purpose in life could be was to help reunite the human family, which is too much uh, in pieces separated. And I decided to resist so I refused and refusing means that uh, I had to quit the two jobs. I had to quit. So I went to work for the International Fellowship of Reconciliation, which is a peace movement that was built during World War II. And I worked there as international secretary, but as I was confronted with that, uh, I was going to be drafted into the army to do what they call military service. And I thought I could also apply for a status of conscientious objector because 
there is that legal possibility in France where I was born and, and, uh, and uh, where they would call me into the army. But that civil service existed only as an alternative to the military service or military draft. So it, it didn't exist per se. I was ready to do civil service to society, but not as an alternative so that they could keep drafting other people into the army. They make you an exception to the rule in order to maintain the rule. So I said, if I disagree with the rule, and all the more so that uh, France is a nuclear power. Now, what is the basis of a nuclear state? It's the nuclear deterrence. So they are telling you that if you do this or that, or if you invade me, I will retaliate with nuclear might and I will destroy your cities like they did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But you see, at the end of World War II, the winners of the war established what they called the Nuremberg Tribunal, where they judged the Nazis for the crimes against humanity that they had done during the war. So they judged these people, but on the basis of what text of law there was nothing that described a crime against humanity at that time. So they drafted a text of what is a crime against humanity. And those people were judged for having committed a crime against humanity, the leaders, the Nazi leaders. So they established a principle of law, which was very strong. Your conscience should have told you that you were doing something which is unacceptable for the entire humankind. And therefore we judge you on that basis. And people were sentenced, even sentenced to death and the death sentences were executed. Now, if you look at the use of a nuclear bomb, it is a crime against humanity. Absolutely. The text of law of Nuremberg says that the preparation of a crime against humanity is a crime against humanity in itself. It also says that the complicity in a crime against humanity is a crime in itself. So I could not be drafted into an army that uses military power to the point that they are ready to drop a nuclear bomb on the country without being myself, yeah. the accomplice in the preparation of a crime against humanity, therefore doing myself a crime against humanity. I argued uh, on that basis with the military court that uh, judged me. But what I did is that I thought you cannot just be a witness and, and, and live according to your conscience. When you're confronted with something like that, you must use that to change something in society. So I said, okay, what is it that I can do? I cannot lead a campaign and abolish the army. Uh, it's beyond uh, my reach at that time, but I'm gonna be judged by a military court. Okay, what is a military court? If you are a military judge, judging somebody who's a soldier because he's done something that uh, you think is not right, as one of my witnesses in the trial uh, that uh, under which I was submitted, he said the military court who's judging somebody is, it's like a court of butchers who judges a vegetarian because he doesn't want to eat meat. You know, it's, it's really like that. So, I decided to mount a campaign, a double campaign. One to abolish military courts, and the other one is to confront the military 
internationally. So I constituted a group of conscientious objectors who are what we call total resistors, not even asking for uh, substitution doing civil service. I'm all volunteer for universal civil service, but not as an alternative so that they can uh, keep doing the same thing with others and, and putting them into the army. So I mounted a group, an international group, with people from Italy, France, uh, the Netherlands, uh, Switzerland, and, and all that, you know, so that we show that we are united across borders. There's only one single human family. We shouldn't split it into nations. We have to respect and, and even protect cultures. This is the wealth, you know, the differences and all that is so beautiful, but we are one single family and we shouldn't be pitted against each other in any circumstances or even fighting openly each other and killing each other, you know? So I considered that international and two, I mounted the campaign to abolish military courts. Mm. I was judged by a military court. So I, all of us, basically we spent, I mean, the sentence was more or less that you would spend two years in jail. So I, I constructed the, 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 the campaign. You find the legal arguments to justify that military courts should be abolished, but you also use every single trial of anyone who has a conscious objective is judged by a military court. Plus what happens to soldiers who disobey, who do something wrong and uh, all that. So it took me quite a while, um, but uh, I went to parliament. I went to talk to quite a number of members of parliament, uh, talk to uh, people who became, yes, Jean, what year was this when you were being tried by the military court? Excuse me, when? What year was it? When was this? It was, I, was tried, I was tried in 1979. Hmm. 1979. And, 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 and you were saying you went to parliament? Yes. And, and I, I went to, to, to discuss with members of parliament. I went to, you know, and we organized events each time. We, we organized demonstrations. We, we published uh, things, we were present at, uh, you know, all the trials and, and all that, so that the absurdity of that system, uh, you know, became, became obvious. And, and then uh, eventually uh, in 1982, the parliament had to take the issue because it was, the pressure was strong because the debate was huge. Uh, and because we had convinced enough people in political parties and, and they abolished the military courts in France. So uh, you see, when something happens in your life and you're trying to follow your conscience and be true to yourself and, and be faithful to your brothers and sisters in humanity, it's not enough. If, if you can use that to change something so that structurally society becomes a little bit better, you should do it. And so that's what we've done. And, and, and so we've moved just one step forward. Now we haven't changed everything, but at least if during the course of your life, you can move things one millimeter in the right direction, one inch in the right direction, Absolutely. It's already something that we've gained. Absolutely. So when we look back, uh, Jean, say over uh, a, now about 80 years of, uh, you know, War Resisters International, the Fellowship of Reconciliation, more recently there is the uh, Peace Force Initiative, etc. Uh, yesterday I had a chat with David Hartsbow on the World Beyond War, uh, so looking back on, I would say it's going to soon be a century of such initiatives. What is your feeling today about the prospects of a civilizational shift away from warfare? Well, we have a lot of work to do because warfare is taking new forms. And right now you have armies that are working on cyber war. They are working on 
what they call artificial intelligence. Well, I call it more uh, human stupidity than artificial intelligence, but, but um, they're working on these things. They are mobilizing brains, building robots, uh, inventing things to hurt your computers so that uh, entire things collapse in, in a society that you can't run a hospital because it's all based on computer data and, and then you can't even cure people. So they're going against all the principles that we've uh, concurred uh, over centuries uh, of, of uh, civil movements. Um, you know, if, if you even think of Geneva principles uh, that establish some rules for war, I mean, as if war could be uh, humanized, but at least, you know, there were limits that were established that there are things that you couldn't do. It just blows everything up. Yeah. So we are at a time when even some people uh, want to have uh, nuclear armament. They use biological uh, weapons and, 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 and so on and so forth. So, Jean, are I you saying, question... sorry, no, 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 go ahead, please. No, no, I, I, you know, I question our work as war resistors, our work as peace movement. We have to be smarter than what we have been. We are sometimes good at complaining, at demonstrating, but demonstrating or complaining is not winning a battle. You know, one thing I learned from Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi was always in search of truth, of something, you know, which is higher than ourselves. But he was a fantastic strategist. He was an incredible political strategist. So I, I studied his life, you know, thoroughly to understand what I should be doing in my life and what we should be doing as a peace movement. So we have not yet uh, grown up to the situation where we can uh, go beyond protesting. We have to construct our battles so that we win certain things. We concur freedoms and, and we, we, we grow up as human beings. Mm. You know, uh, yeah. we are, I was born in a world of 2.4 billion people. We are close to 8 billion. It took from the first human being on earth until 1824 to have the first billion person on earth, it will take 15 years to add 1 billion to what we are now. Yeah. We have all become interdependent during the course of my life. Yeah. We were not when I was born. We are because of the limited resources of this planet. So we have to behave differently. We have to behave as a family. And, yeah. and we as a peace movement can obtain so, something, but it depends on each and every of us. We have to take our responsibilities in life and refuse what is wrong and, and not cooperate with what is wrong. Are you saying that the military industrial complex and technology where it stands today is already a violation of the Geneva Conventions? Did I understand that correctly? Yes, it is. I, I would argue that. I would argue that because yeah. it is preparing things which are definitely a crime against humanity. If you block the computers of an entire region, you know, some people will be blocked who have to be transported to the uh, hospital. The hospital won't function. I mean, if you, just if you take that side of uh, things, yeah. some people will starve, you know? So, uh, and, and, and mind you, I mean, there's something that I fought my entire life against hunger in the world. Today, some people are concerned about coronavirus and they are ready to accept to be locked down in their homes or to wear masks and this and that. And you know, for what? For which number of deaths when every year and this year again, nine, nine million people will lose their life 
because of their lack of access to food, which is something easy to resolve. We may not know how to cure coronavirus, but we know how to tackle hunger. And by the way, there's more food being produced in the world than what we can consume today. Yeah. So we are structurally badly organized. We are structurally organized so that some people can make money not to help each other. And what we have to do is that we have to move towards a society in which we're not competing with each other, but in which we are taking care of each other. That's what we need, the society of care, the culture of care. You know, I'm here for you and you'll be here for me. You know, that's what we have to build. What use is it to have sent all children to school if we fail to do that? What is it that we're teaching? What we have to teach is cooperation. We are all interdependent. We should hold hands with each other. It's time to grow. Okay, so we have to desert competition and we have to build the solidarity. Yep. It's not by chance that Gandhi was trying to teach things of the everyday life from the toilets yeah. to, uh, you know, how you grow food differently and living in a village in, in unity. Yeah. We have to do that at every step in our life. Stop considering the other person as a competitor, but as somebody who has needs and I am the custodian of your life. That's what we have to, to do. But that can be done only if we live that. Yeah. Well, you, know, you got to do this through the UN system. You were uh, for a substance. I think you're still connected to that effort in some way. Uh, so could you at this stage tell us how the within the UN system, there has been an attempt to promote the social and solidarity economy and uh, how far has that effort come? I mean, because it's clearly an attempt to address the systemic violence of our times, right? The structural violence. But is there a prospect that this, well, this could help to bring nonviolence in the economic sphere? There is, and I will tell you something which is very important. It's always individuals who make the difference. That's why we each have to look at, each, at ourselves in the mirror, in the eyes, and say, what am I doing with my life? You see, if you talk about the UN, you have two sides to the UN. What is the UN? It's an institution that has been created at the end of World War II in order to make sure that there would be no war anymore, that people could live peacefully and we even built at the UN some programs of assistance in order to correct the imbalances among nations. So where I work, the United Nations Development Program is meant to help poorer countries to come up to the same level as the richest countries so that there would be no rich and poor. You know, we'd all be on the same level, okay? Now, uh, the current situation is that we have the biggest uh, imbalances of the entire history, right? Uh, but when I say it's all those individuals who make a difference, you have the UN is on one hand, who makes the decision? Governments are making the decision at the General Assembly and in the Security Council. In the General Assembly, one country, one vote. So Tuvalu and Tonga carries the same weight as China, India, or the United States. But we at the UN are proposing things, not just as governments. You have the staff of the UN, the staff. And that's where sometimes you have a difference because the General Assembly it's the common denominator among all countries. So you have debates, disagreements, agreements on certain things, disagreements on some others and all that. So, okay. Um, but as an institution, you can make a difference. I will give you one example. 
at some point, the head of the United Nations Development Program uh, is uh, appointed by the General Assembly, but you know they choose uh, somebody proposed by George Bush, the father, not uh, the son, uh, Bill Draper. He was the head of the Exim Bank, the Export-Import Bank of the uh, United States. He was a venture capitalist uh, who made a fortune in, in, in venture capital. But he was a good man, son of Bill Draper, who did the Marshall Plan at the end uh, of World War II. Comes Mahbubul Haq, former Minister of Finance of Pakistan and former, uh, formerly from, from the World Bank. Mahbub had an idea. He said, why is it that when we look at how a nation is doing, we look at its GDP, the gross domestic product. When you meet a friend, what do you say? You don't say, what did you produce last week, last month, or last year? You know, you say, how are you? Because you want to care for that person. So the question is, how is the country? How is its people? How is it faring? Are things fine or not? So he wanted to shift the attention from the GDP to something else. He created the Human Development Index. Proposed that to Bill Draper. That venture capitalist saw because he was good hearted, you know, uh, the value of it. And there we went and we produced the first human development report in 1990. Did you work on it, John? Did you work on yes, that? Yes, I worked with Mabub. I worked with Mabub and, and he's, I, I learned lots of things from Mabub al -Haq. He and Amatya Sen uh, were friends and he brought Amatya Sen into the picture. And, and there was a constant dialogue between the two. So Amartya Sen inspired a lot of things also uh, in, in, in the report. And, and frankly, I was inspired by, by, uh, by them. Uh, they, so, but you see, some individuals bring an idea and the entire world started looking at the Human Development Index. Now, okay, they may not have made all the use that we would have dreamed, but Year after year, that report, uh, whenever it was published, made noise, and some countries have changed their policies thanks to that. Yeah. So you see the might of an individual. But when it came to the General Assembly, some countries objected to what we published in the report. Because when you do something, you always disturb somebody. You know, you always disturb somebody. If you don't it's disturb anyone. Especially when you tell the truth. Exactly. When you tell the truth, you disturb somebody. So those who don't want to grow, those who don't want to change, uh, are still trying to block you. And, and so uh, we're accused of being too much pro-developing countries, pro-poor. We're accused of being too much pro-LGBT uh, or whatever. You know, you, you can be accused of anything. So, um, but... We pulled it through and we managed. And, and in the end, uh, you know, it, it, it was recognized as, as, as something important. So uh, in the course of the years, uh, the, the General Assembly adopted in, in the year 2000, in the, in, the, in the 90s, we organized conferences at the UN. The conferences are debating among uh, the governments, it's debates among the governments, but we invited the civil society next to the government. So you have 200 governments in, in a room and you have 40,000 people from the civil society at the forum of civil society next door so that you can organize the dialogue. So you see, there's an obligation by the UN to do that, but some civil servants have the idea that if you organize the forum, you create a dialogue. Nobody can prevent you from doing that. You do it and, and you have something. So we had the conference on environment and development, population and development, gender uh, differences and, and, and so on and so forth. During the nineties, each time we had an action plan. And thanks to that, we come to the year 2000 and we say, we have to do something big. And somebody has the idea. We 
are going to set some new objectives, not in, in uh, money terms, but in human terms. What about putting the challenge in the year 2000 of starting the new century by making sure that in the first 15 years of the new century, we have the proportion of people who suffer hunger and poverty, absolute poverty. You know, when I joined the UN and I was talking about poverty eradication, my colleagues were, you know, tapping me on the shoulder, Jean, I mean, quite down. Uh, poverty reduction, talk about poverty reduction because, I mean, poverty has always been with us. So how are we going to eradicate poverty? And I said, but, you know, stop a minute. You never talk about reducing torture. We talk about eradicating torture. Why should we talk about reducing poverty? The aim is to eliminate poverty, unless you've chosen to be poor, but you know, uh, and, and, and to eradicate hunger. Nobody should suffer from hunger. But, you know, say, well, uh, can we really do that? So in the year 2000, those objectives are set that by 2015, we should have poverty and we should have uh, hunger. It was difficult, but as we saw in the UN, as staff, not as governments, that maybe we were not going to achieve those results, we organized the campaign. It was called the Millennium Campaign. We hired Evelyn Hefkens, who was a minister in the Dutch government, to head the campaign. And, and then um, uh, after that, uh, what's his name, uh, from India, who, who uh, headed uh, after that Amnesty International. Sh um, well, the name will come back to me. In a, okay. uh, um, so we mounted the campaign in order to make sure that civil society would put pressure on the governments. Because, you know, if your government is not doing what it voted in the General Assembly, you can hold it accountable. If the word of the government is not followed, it means that your words are meaningless. And you are there, you vote in the General Assembly on our behalf as the expression of our values. You're going to use our money to carry out the programs. So what is it? You know, you have to walk the talk. And, and, and so we obtain results through that. Not all countries achieved the results, that we, but globally, we achieved that. And thanks to that, for the last two years preceding the deadline of 2015, we organized a big consultation at UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. We had more than 2 million people responding to our consultation in order to say, uh, what do we do next? So in 2015, all the countries in the General Assembly voted what they called, adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. And for the first time in the history of humankind, all governments committed to eradicating hunger and eradicating extreme poverty by 2030. And that's what it was called the 2030 Agenda. Now, when we see that, some of us in the UN system said, Okay, but our uh, economy is not leading to that. So we took the initiative of putting, uh, shedding some light on social and solidarity economy, a different way of relating to each other, of producing and exchanging with each other, social and solidarity economy, the cooperatives, all these things, all, you know, all the things that put people over profits. Oh. And, and because we organized that group, then the agencies of the system, the International Labour Organization, the United Nations Development Program, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and so on and so forth, you know, some people from these institutions joined and we created that group and it grew and, and it, it was more and more heard. It's always people who make a difference. Wherever you work, wherever you are, you can make a difference if you 
see clearly and, and set yourself some goals and work hard to uh, towards uh, reaching uh, these build things and you will uh, change things. And that's how the United Nations Task Force on Social and Solidarity Economy was born. Yeah. And now but, we are hoping to obtain a resolution by the General Assembly on that. But Jean, in the last, uh, say, 10, 20 years, do you think the world has moved closer or moved further away from the prospects of a social and solidarity economy? Are you hopeful that in the coming decade uh, of the 20s, uh, that we can actually make some structural shifts in favor of a nonviolent economy? I'm not hopeful. I'm determined. Sorry, you which are? Is I'm determined. Ah, determined. I'm, to achieve that goal. So the question is not to be hopeful. The question is, I know we can do it. Okay. I know so we can. can you outline now? Can you give us the four or five ways in which this is can be worked for? Yes, in, in a nutshell, first, you have two movements that contradict each other in our society today. You have those who are profiting from the system, making fortunes. I mean, eight people own as much as half of humankind. So this is absurd, obscene even. Now, at the same time, you have all these initiatives which happen at the grassroots that the media don't report about because the media are giving you the bad news, the sensational, sensational news that, you know, tear your heart. And, and in fact, there are many things happening in society. People are building things differently. People are using even the internet to build solidarity network. I take one of my own daughters. She's confronted with the fact that uh, in uh, one of the cities uh, where she, she studies uh, psychology, she goes there and, and she can't find an apartment. Uh, it's, it's complicated. Uh, prices go up. Uh, people are profiting from the fact that there's a huge demand on that. She created a Facebook group in Lausanne uh, for people to support each other on that. Now, in no time in the city of Lausanne, Switzerland, you have 42,000 people, you know, who uh, are members of that group. So there are many things that are happening in society where people are trying something different, where solidarity expresses itself uh, in, in whatever way. So, you have uh, all these initiatives of Friday for the Future. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, children, school children go on strike and say, what, what did you do to us? There is no power in the world which is not what we concede. Nobody can force me to do something that I don't want to do if I'm ready to pay the price for saying no to something yeah. on which I, I disagree. If I'm alone, you know, I may uh, suffer from that. But if we are many, and if we hold hands with each other, you know, where is the power of the so-called powerful? The power that somebody has over us is only what we allow that person to, uh, to do. We have to organize ourselves differently. We can desert the society of competition. We can build ethical banks even that fund our projects because we withdraw. I, I did it. You know, in 2008, when we had this uh, crisis, financial crisis that hit the entire world uh, because the banking system uh, was in trouble, having exaggerated in the wrong things that they did. We are paid at the UN through one of the biggest banks in the world. Okay, I saw that they didn't change their habits. So I decided to withdraw every penny uh, I had in the bank. They ran after me for weeks. Yeah, but you put that money in, into an ethical bank if you have some, no? 
and we can build things together. So that is social and solidarity economy. We can build it. We don't have to wait. We can, we can construct our tools to resist the system because we build a new society. We don't have to wait so, until tomorrow. Uh, if we are united, uh, we can do things uh, our own way. So, so that is what uh, we have to do. I, I, I say I'm determined. I know that it's difficult and it is particularly difficult because my generation, and I always uh, ask the young people today to forgive me. I ask you, forgive me for what I failed to obtain because we are the first generation, we, who hands over to its children a situation which is worse than the one it has inherited from its own parents. We are handing over fantastic technological progresses. We are handing over the production of wealth, global wealth, which is at its peak. But we are handing over climate change, the destruction of soils, of the, the pollution of the air, uh, all these things which create an impossible future for our children. Never had it happened in the past. So if we have some love for our children, for our grandchildren, you know, we have to rebuild things differently. I'm not allowed to die until I have fixed the mess that my generation has created. And, and we can do it. We have the power to do it. We just have to realize it. And very often, uh, and that is what is important, people don't realize the power that they have because they don't exert it. So that's why all the small things that you can obtain through solidarity action at whatever level, in whatever field is important because it teaches people that they have power and that united uh, we, we can make a difference. And, and, and we have to think of the values on which our societies are built. And the values are not what we aim for. It is what we do. It's how we live. Yeah. Well, that's where I was coming, that in closing, uh, what are some of the inner strengths that you would advise young people to cultivate that would give them the staying power and the courage and the determination to continue on this path? What are some of the inner qualities that you know you would recommend or and, and how, how does one cultivate them? Well, look at other people in the eyes and think of what is more important for you. When uh, some planes crashed into the uh, towers in New York, people knew it and people who were in the plane flying towers Washington DC hijacked by the same type of terrorists knew that their plane was going to crash against something. Those who could pick the phone to call their family, not their banker. They didn't call their banker, they called their family and to say what? I love you. The last words that we want to do. I am asking each of us, think, what is a successful life? What is it that you want to transmit to your children, if you have any, or to your grandchildren in terms of value? What is it, really? You know? Think about these things. When you die, what do you want to be remembered for? If you really think about these things, you will find the inner truth and you will find the importance of love. We want to be loved, but give love to others. And that's the most beautiful way to carry your life. You will discover that. And, and just understand that's the heart of what human beings are about. The difference between the human being and some of the rest of what happens in the world is precisely that. It's the power of love and the importance of love. So for the sake of whoever we love, 
we have to, but we can make this world a better place. Thank you so much.